my pleasure to introduce a person who, after 20 years as a broadcaster with the ABC Radio uh, National and Channel 10, is now a freelance journalist and facilitator. Uh, she presents a travel program for Qantas, which I think would be challenging, <laughs> and uh, once, believe it or not, appeared, I love this, on ABC TV's Play School as a silent clown called Plain Jane. Who better to host the personal stories of what happens when something goes wrong with the brain with Johnny Famishon, Glennis Famishon and Raina Purge. Please make welcome Julie McCrossan. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. And it's my great pleasure to also ask you to welcome three people who are joining me on stage for our, our personal story. Uh, John Famishon and his wife, Glennis. Would you make them welcome? And also Ragnar Purji, uh, a therapist who's played an enormous role in John's recovery. Please make him welcome as well. Ladies and gentlemen, I ask you again to make us welcome. Thank you. Wow. Well, for those of you who are not up with the world of boxing, John is a former featherweight world champion. He is in the LA World Boxing Hall of Fame. Hooray! <laughs> 56 wins and 20 knockouts. Perhaps unusual for mind and its potential, but that's what this man has achieved. Give him a clap. More, more. <laughs> about is your, oh, brilliant. your brilliant <laughs> sir, but also your recovery from a, a, an accident. Do you remember the accident back in 1991? Uh, not exactly, but I have to remember it because I'm as I am now. But a lot of things must go to Ragnar. Yeah. Ragnar's been a, a life-changing part of your world, hasn't he? Wouldn't go that far. <laughs> <laughs> I met John in the beginning of March 1990, it was on a blind date, <laughs> and we met again the next morning and we've been together ever since. That's right, and ever of since. course uh, a, a tremendous athlete. Mm -hmm. Tell us what happened in 1991, what happened at the accident? John was crossing a, quite a dangerous road up at Warwick Farm, he didn't realise that he was just a visitor, and he was hit by a car and in a coma for three weeks. Um, we knew at the time that he, he had had a stroke. Somewhere in that process, whether before or just after, the left side was paralysed. He had brain stem damage. He was 47, but such a fit man, they thought he was in his late 20s. He was just so incredibly fit, good looking, still is. I concur. <laughs> and um, it took us a day to find out where he was because he was listed as John Doe, didn't have any identification on him as John Doe, and with the injuries that he had, he wasn't recognisable at that stage, but um, just so fit. But when we did find him, and uh, then he was unconscious and hooked, when we got to the hospital, hooked up to every machine you could think of, then he finally came out of it and left with um, very, very serious injuries, particularly the brain stem damage, dislocated shoulder, all sorts of things. I mean, essentially, John was unable to walk or talk. That's right. That's right. I, I'm keen, obviously, to, in the time that we have, to focus on, on Ragnar's role. But before we do that, we have a room here of diverse health professionals and others. And John did spend uh, uh, over a year in a number of rehabilitation centres. And you believe they made a contribution. What yeah. contribution did they make? And where was John up to just before he met Ragnar? They, they certainly made a big contribution, but it just brought John to a certain stage. He went through Bethesda, 
Royal Talbot, Hampton Rehabilitation, and from then on we had to be to do it ourselves privately. And but John couldn't walk, couldn't talk, couldn't feed himself, couldn't do anything. And um, they brought him back to a, a certain state of being able to walk if he went out to the hospital once and he was walking at Royal Talbot holding onto a wire fence. He had to be completely supported and learn everything again. But then when we were released from uh, Hampton Rehabilitation, John was in a wheelchair, his chin on his chest, his voice was a whisper. I thought, uh, how is his neck muscles ever going to hold his head up again? And we were told that this is how your situation is, you have to adapt to this. We both came out crying and said, we can't be like this. And um, John said, I said, I've got to walk again. But we didn't have any, didn't know where to go. And this went on for quite some time until Ragnar came into our life through a mutual friend and um, um, got in touch with us and spoke about helping John, um, came over and spoke with John for three hours one Saturday afternoon and John afterwards said, that was the best time I've had. And I relayed that on to Ragnar and, uh, and he was thrilled as well. Can I ask you, John, do you recall that first meeting with Ragnar, the first time you met him? Fortunately, no. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> because I, I know that you feel the first thing you noticed about this man on the end of the row is the amount of time he gave John. Yes, yes. And I'm the, very and grateful for that. Why? Why are you grateful for that? For his patience. And the time he spent doing the things he did to me. What are the things he did that you think made the big difference? So you walked on here today and In indeed walked when you married this woman I'm sitting beside. You were determined to walk again before you married and you did. Best part was getting married to my woman. <laughs> And we're going, all right? Oh, yeah, great. <laughs> <laughs> He's in the good books. <laughs> <laughs> you may laugh. <alarm. laughs> it's true. Someone who really loves you and sticks by you, that's good for recovery, isn't it? I'll say, yeah. don't have to make a big thing about it. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone knows that. <laughs> meeting John, why did you spend three hours and you were immediately drawn to this man, weren't you? Well, well made attractive. <laughs> <laughs> you are attractive. It, no, it's true in relation to I, I think it was not just me, but uh, all of Australia is drawn to John as a result of what he's achieved and, and what occurred to him and uh, the meeting that I had with uh, a colleague, a friend of ours, a mutual friend in the, in the streets of Melbourne. Now, our, our conversation was about John and I met uh, then Glennis and John through a phone call and they were very supportive of what I was talking about and, and uh, you know, here's a person with a strange name, Ragnar Purgy, that rings and, and yet she was very supportive and, and then uh, fr from that first conversation that I had with, with John that went for three hours, I found this profound intellect. I mean, he was talking very slowly. His, his body was, as Glenda said, his uh, chin was on his chest. His body was in a very uh, poor state but this immense intellect was coming through. So I was the galah. That's exactly right, John. Right, you know you're touching me. See? <laughs> <laughs> and, and this was, was coming through from, uh, from our initial meeting, and, uh, and I said to Glenn, I said, John's got this immense intellect and powerful wit, and in the three hours I was exhausted from laughing. And then, uh, and then the process started, and... and and, and I spoke with John, I said, I've got this idea. And, uh, and the only thing they said was, look, as long as you don't cause any, any, any have, have any problems, um, go ahead. And the first thing I did was when I started the, the, the process, which I now call uh, an army, um, was simply to hold John's hand, his left hand, and just move it. And we were just talking and conversing. B because my idea was, well, how do you get to the brain? How do you make brain changes? Well, there's only one way, through movement. And my, with my background in physical education, the sports sciences and psychology, and karate's played a big role in that as well. Well, 
start stimulating the neurological processes and then, then I wasn't interested in what John couldn't do at all. I was only I remember interested that. Only in what he could do. So as I was manipulating his arm, it's more powerful for him to move his body than for me to move it. As I'm listening, what I'm trying to do, and I guess what I'm encouraging you to do, is to think, what are the lessons from this one man's story or one couple's story? Wonderful man. One wonderful man's story that may be applicable uh, to the work that others in this room do. And what I'm already hearing is that focus on what... John could do. Why is that the critical beginning? Well, it's obvious. I think it's self-evident for me that it's self-evident what the body can't do. So let's not worry about that. Let's worry about what we can do. And my theory is based on the view that that the brain and, and the, the theories are, are now much more self-evident in the research that the brain has the potential to heal itself and it will the, the recovery neurologically will take over from parts that were damaged. So let's work, work on what we can do because we can move that forward. Right, so the, the danger of this kind of presentation, the one story in the midst of a conference that is so evidence-based, is that it, it can bring hope that may not be able to be fulfilled or false expectations. But I understand that part of your philosophy is that there are no guarantees and no promises when you begin. Is that right? That's the first thing I said to both John and Glennis. No promises, no guarantees, but I've got these ideas and let's work with them and see what's happening. And every week there was a change in John's behaviour. Every week something was occurring that was quite astounding. Glennis, describe mm. what you just saw happening. What were the key things they were doing together? Ragnar had John doing multiple things which was really stimulating him. And from the very first afternoon, I saw John improve. His whole being, as well as his, his movement, slowly at first, and then Ragnar would come every Saturday and spend the day with us, came from Geelong to Frankston, and spend the day with us and go through a series of exercises, and then we would practice all week, and then he would come back and do more, and John got stronger, but his outlook got better. His How whole person. He, he became calmer, his head got stronger, he's holding up his head because I didn't think that was ever going to happen. His voice got better as time went on. We were learning how to, to use his voice. Um, and he just got stronger and stronger to just one example of what a, a, a bad stage we were in. The first time I was drying, drying John's feet, he was having a shower, he'd had a shower, sorry, I was drying his feet and he put his watch on. Now John was doing two things at once, that had never happened before. And I was crying, I was so ecstatic, I rang Ragnar. That just had never happened since the accident. Actually lifting your foot and putting a watch on, that's how, you know, what a bad stage we were at. That, and it just got better and better from there until John was just walking with the cane. Um, Actually, the, one of the great things was John riding, we have a stationary bike, and John riding his stationary bike and Ragnar shadow boxing with him. And Damn. we never thought that was going to be oh, possible. I missed. <laughs> <laughs> and he had My right cross fist. <laughs> you're lucky. I am lucky. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I was about to say, you're a brave man. I, I should uh, let you know that this book, uh, The Method, available outside and it shows the extraordinary career of John as a boxer so to shadow box is certainly a brave act <laughs> to, to engage in. I mean tell us about this, I think you call it the multimodal approach, but why is doing multiple different things at the same time important? Yes, it, I call it the intensive multimodal. You thought I was punchy. <laughs> That's the last thing I've ever thought of, John. <laughs> no. uh, intensive well, go on, then. I oh, will, John. This is what goes on all the time. John and I are sparring all the time. <laughs> and uh, um, I call it intensive multimodal enrichment and stimulation. So the, the more the body's able to do, the more multiple tasks it, it does, I take the view that there are, there's greater neurological potential. <clears throat> Excuse me, and I would actually take John to the point where he was doing so many different activities at the same time, there was actually an uh, emotional frustration occurring. 
and, and I would monitor that carefully and then and bring uh, and then reduce the the multiple tasks and then increase them again with a view to again stretching the, the mind you might say or stretching the brain and increasing the physical fitness and then reducing it again because I took the view that the the to the greater edge that John went to, the greater neurological potential there was. And I, th I believe, in my view, that in terms of what John has achieved, that it, it has become a self-evident that was occurring. Otherwise, the changes wouldn't be occurring if it wasn't the neurological changes. And one of the most powerful things that I, I, I saw, one of them, was that one day that John actually ran. Uh, we were out in his backyard and, and, and I saw potential, I said, why don't we run? And John ran, I was holding him. He was actually running, both feet leaving the ground. He ran, he ran to Glennis. He, he hugged Glennis, I hugged Glennis. We were hugging and holding and, and, and there was a crying. group hug and a group how cry and... How dare you? Yes. <laughs> Get in on the act. I do. <laughs> Can I just say, in the time you've met John, you can see that verbal sparring is a constant part of our, your way of relating. Your oral skills are critical for the relationships that you have. How did well, you how can I, if I keep quiet? <laughs> I can't put my point across. <laughs> how did you learn to speak again? Because for a while there, you weren't speaking. Yeah. How did you learn to speak again? I learned the ABC. <laughs> I'll always support the ABC. <laughs> 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 I can't, yes, I can't explain that. No, but no, I understand. But you, you, you would know what the feeling was when I did try and speak and walk. What was the feeling like? Not, uh, to be able to talk was great. Yeah. And not being able to talk must be terrible. Uh, what? What happened to bring John's capacity to speak back? John's voice was so soft, he just didn't have any volume. And I'd, you'd have to either concentrate and put your ear up to his mouth in the very beginning. And then Ragnar suggested we sit in the rumpus room and myself in the kitchen and just get John reading, reading a book. And it was really soft, you could hardly hear. But then, within a matter of months, could hear John up in the kitchen and he was down in the rumpus room and it came back, it came back and with strength, it was absolutely incredible. A matter of months. Mm, so mm, again, mm. if we're looking at lessons to learn from mm. this, incredible patience. Oh yes, and, yeah. and practice, and practice. And practice mm. But also a supportive, loving partner. Uh, I mean, when you ran, you ran to her, even though this mongrel had a great <laughs> Did you say mongrel? <laughs> 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 You're right. But, <laughs> but, you know, not everyone who experiences a catastrophic injury is lucky enough to sustain a relationship. Yeah. I mean, you would you agree, Ragnar, yeah. that the active support and participation of a loving partner is critical? To it was story? fundamental. It was absolutely fundamental. Dennis was right there, and she was an absolute tower of strength mm. in a very difficult situation. She was so supportive of John, and for me, she was so supportive of... Uh, my my position in coming in uh, absolutely critical critical mm. what you do is very intense it was <laughs> i haven't spoken yet <laughs> <laughs> uh, what what ragnar did with you john was incredibly intense over a long time do you think your experience training as a boxer helped you to cope with that intensity? Yeah, I had to. Uh, the beauty about the fight game is that you, you know what you're going to do, you're told what you're going to do, your mind gets prepared, and then that's it. I was trained for that too, yes. not knowing that it was going to happen. So in a way, just as you previously had Ambrose Palmer as a trainer, you now had Ragnar. It was a, it was a similar relationship, wasn't it? Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> was there a difference? A uh, huge difference. <laughs> and, and what was that? 
<laughs> You're getting personal now. <laughs> How important is John's humour in, in his recovery? What do you think, Edna? Oh, look, I think it plays a, uh, a significant role. I mean, John was... Uh, I'll focus back on our first meeting. He was witty and insightful and humorous from our very first meeting. And that demonstrated, because humor is, is, a, is a great intellect. And he had that capacity. And now at this conference, we've seen how important humor is as, as, as part of resilience. But that wasn't something that uh, I thought about or that John thought about uh, when we started in 1993. But the fact of the matter is humor has got a role in resilience. But John had that from the, our very first meeting. And, and as I said, in that first meeting, he could barely talk, but this humour was coming through, and he had me in stitches at the time, and, and that's continued ever since. He's had me in stitches. Glennis, tell us about the promise to marry, but only when he could walk down the aisle. Tell us how that unfolded. You're, you're getting personal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, yes, John said he was actually on Bert Newton's show, and it was absolutely hilarious, the whole... I was at work and, and John had gone in with, with another uh, a carer and, um, and Bert had mentioned about getting married and then John just sparks up and said that he's not going to marry until he can actually walk down, walk down the aisle. So uh, Ragnar got him busy, <laughs> got him uh, practising and walking. He wanted to walk without the cane. That was his main, his main thing, with, without the cane. So um, we did. We had to set a, we set a date, and John's mum came out from France, so it was like a year in advance. And um, Antoinette came from France, and it was an absolutely wonderful day, and such a happy day. It was, you know, everybody was just, just, just so happy for us that we, after all, we'd been through, and John, John had been through. Um, we got to such a, a lovely time in our lives, and and John had actually done what he wanted to do, and that was walk down the aisle without the cane. Did that help you stick to the tough regime, that hope of walking down the aisle? Was that an important goal in recovery? Well, sticking with Ragnar yeah. has nothing Ragnar to do with it. <laughs> has nothing to do with it. Uh, I was looking forward to marrying my bride. What's your name again? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Glenis. It was, it, was a a <laughs> it was a big moment for me to marry Glenis. <laughs> 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 it, 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 I'm involved with some fitness activities and I get told again and again, Julie, you must have a great, big, hairy, audacious goal. That is a direct quote. And I'm just wondering, in your vision of recovery, Ragnar... You still it, got it. <laughs> Is, it a, is there a need for a big specific goal or is it just an incremental step-by-step step not knowing where you're going? I took the view... Who are you asking that oh, well, to? You want to go first? I was asking Ragnar. I'll ask him. Okay. I'll claim him up for a while. <laughs> I took the view in relation to, to the situation at hand to just look at what was possible and just view every session for what was occurring and what was coming next. I didn't have... Uh, any, any hopes uh, in terms of false hopes, but the hope was always there that something greater could occur, but I was always looking for the small increment uh, potential and actualities uh, occurring. And uh, that is still my goal. Uh, even uh, last night after dinner, uh, John and I were walking to the lift and, and I introduced a, a bit of a movement pattern for him just there because I took, even if we just did, did it for five seconds, 10 seconds, there's potential there for that 10 seconds to one day become 10 minutes and move beyond. So the recovery is ongoing, because yes. that was my final oh. question. Yes. Is, what are you doing to continue to recover? Yes, John, is, exercise is very big in our lives. John has a stationary bike, he rides that, he has the step machine. This goes on two or three times a day and half an hour at a time. John does physio, sorry, hydrotherapy four days a week, four days a week, and then... We oh, I've got to go. I've got to ride my bike. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he does Ragnar's exercises. There's a certain group of exercises that we, we keep doing, and um, John's carer helps him do those every day. What, what lesson should I 
should these people take away from this story? What are we, what are we saying to these people? What's your main message? Listen. <laughs> yes, listen. Yes. Because he did listen to you, didn't he? Or him. Yeah. <laughs> he did. He spent three hours listening to you when you couldn't mm. lift your head and your voice was a whisper. I, I don't know that that's that common. Would you agree, ladies and gentlemen? That, that yeah. degree of time can be yeah. hard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You never give up. You never give up. Always be positive. Um, don't let bad thoughts crowd your mind or anything like that. Be positive. Always yeah, keep thinking that things are going to get better. They will if you keep working at it. And I don't... Back in those days when we first met Ragnar, it was hard to know where we were going to be because it was really dark, bad days. But then with Ragnar's help, uh, our whole world changed. Um, and I don't think we would, I know, we wouldn't be in this situation where that we can actually go out um, without Ragnar. Just from, I saw it from the beginning, from where we were to where we are now, and it's absolutely mind-blowing. The state John was in to what he can do is, and it's all Ragnar's exercises, his therapies, and uh, bringing that all together was wonderful. And that's the best thing I think that's happened is meeting Ragnar since John had the accident. Look, Ragnar has a, a little book outside that uh, sums up his philosophy, but one last word from you, sir, your, your message from this story. Uh, don't uh, listen to any negativity ever. Don't listen to uh, anyone uh, putting you down or saying this is not possible. Don't listen to negativity. Go with what you believe. I can is hear the... someone in the room thinking, you'll give people false hope and break their hearts. What would you say? Don't make false promises, but don't listen to negativity. That's a choice that you can make. If people are putting you down, send them to the moon uh, cognitively. Don't listen to negativity. Just go with what you know is your own truth. John, I think the message from this story is to marry handsome boxers with a sense of humour. <laughs> That's what I'm taking away from this. It's been a pleasure I'm to meet I'm punch you. drunk. <laughs> I might say the wrong thing. <laughs> How no, dare no. you? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I ask you to give my guests a warm round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.